What? You changing my volume? Yeah, OK. Um, so a few things. Uh, we'll have some more announcement. Um, we, we're trying to figure out uh, with respect to the strike, that possible strike that's going to be maybe continuing to Tuesday in the midterm with uh, uh, what to do exactly. So this has been uh, being discussed right now among our staff. And we have some solutions. We actually think we have pretty good solutions. So um, but I'll, once Anna gets in here, once it's fully decided, then, uh, then we'll, we'll provide an announcement. I actually have a, a favor uh, to ask you. So um, I'm, I'm going to take a video now, if, the, if you don't mind. Is that OK? Anybody disagree? Can I take a video? Just raise your hand, L1. OK. Take a video. OK. You know, so uh, you know, I'm, 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 a, I'm an instructor. You know, I teach a lot of students, undergrads and grad students. And I've been teaching at Cal for, I know, uh, since 2010. So there's a lot of students went through it. Um, I always remember, though, uh, you know, I was also a student at some point. And uh, all the teachers that I had always influenced kind of how I'm teaching and also what I do. And they always have, you know, this, you know, sense of, you know, influence. And I think that in second hand also influences you in some way. So uh, my uh, high school physics teacher is having an 80th birthday. And I just wanted to congratulate my high school teacher, Yossi. And uh, if, if you don't mind to participate, I just want to say happy birthday, Yossi. Is that, is that okay? Ready? If we all say together, and I'll just do that. Is that fine? Thank you. So uh, look at all these students here. There you go. And then, ready? Three, two, one. Happy birthday, Yossi. Happy birthday. Mazalto. Thank you so much. And it is recorded, so thank you. So do we have a, we have a final decision? Do you want to do you want to take over? Yes. Hi everyone. Well, we made some decisions about the midterm situation to try to make things um, least confusing possible for everybody. Pay attention. Hey, Dib. Uh, are you paying attention? Okay. So. Midterm is still going to happen on Tuesday, no matter what. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, you already put so much work on it, right? Um, so plan A is midterm is going to happen in class, during class, in this room. Yes. So be prepared to come to class to take the midterm here on Tuesday, same day uh, during class. Of course, there will be no class, but there is a very good class yeah. by an amazing instructor. Recorded. Recorded. In previous semesters of the yeah, same Yeah, with material. the same subject, with, with really good jokes even, Really good jokes right? even, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And commentary and all commentary. of that. Commentary. That we're going to release, that you can watch at night instead of doing the midterm, okay? So we're just going to flip the, 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 the schedule. And, and if that instructor is better, then we'll just keep on going like with that. If that instructor is better, yeah. I think you had long hair. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Okay, um, then what if the strike ends at 11 a.m. on Tuesday? Then things go back to normal. Right? So you have to come to class. No matter what, you have to be here on Tuesday at 12.30. No matter what, you should be ready to take the test by then. Right? So come prepared to take the test. If the strike ended, then we give you the lecture and you take the midterm at night. If there is a strike, you take the midterm and you watch the recording at night. Okay? 
So no matter what, on Tuesday you have to do two things for this class. Watch a lecture and take a midterm. The time will be determined by the, by the strike. Clear? Go ahead. Okay, um, the question is, I'll repeat, it's a very good question, and of course we thought about it. Uh, question is, if the midterm is during class and the class is uh, shorter than the time that we have to, uh, to do the midterm, will the midterm be shorter? Yes. We cut questions from the midterm, the midterm is shorter no matter what. If you take the midterm in class, it will be adequate time to be done in 80 minutes, which is the time that we have. If the strike ends and you take the <coughs> midterm at night, you have two hours to do a midterm that was designed for 80 minutes. Oh yeah, thank you, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Okay? What did you say about university? Huh? That was a joke, that was a joke. What was the joke? I like jokes. No well, matter what, your midterm is going yeah. to be shorter now because we prepared for yeah, it. Yeah, your midterm is shorter. Okay. <laughs> you can smile or... Can smile. But it's harder. You can... But it's uh, harder. Yeah. Shorter or harder. We uh -huh. just double the values on every single problem. Like every value that we have, like 5 volts, it's 10 volts now. <laughs> so that it's harder. But you told you see, them. See, I got now. some good ideas today. I know, but now you told them the secrets. Okay, oh. any other question? Because this question was very good. So, questions? Clear? Okay. Are we going? Yeah, I think so. Like with lecture and stuff? <laughs> yeah. I just don't remember what I'm supposed to teach. <laughs> oh, it's just another been so question. Long. Hold on. Sometimes. In some semester, uh, Anna lets me ease into the module by teaching some previous lectures. Is there going to be enough room for all of us in here to take? Oh, yeah, there will. Yeah. There's plenty of room here. There's plenty of room. Oh, but you have to come prepared to bring all your stuff to the front so that we have space to walk around um, uh, without tripping uh, on your backpacks. But that's it. You bring your notes. You don't use anything that is in your backpack anyway. Don't trip on backpacks. No, it would, it's, that would be terrible. Yeah, and uh, uh, Mickey and I will be proctoring, so no funny business. How many points? Uh, How many points? Yeah. How many points? Why does it matter? 200. Do you feel better? Okay, what if it was 100? You know, we <laughs> double the points, kept the same, uh, same percentage. <laughs> the points doesn't matter. Just study. It's harder now. You know what? Double. <laughs> we haven't printed yet, so we can always yeah, change. Yeah, we can always yeah. double the points. Okay. All right. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. Take it away, Mickey. Well, we got to think kind of what's going on. So as I was, oh, wow, look at that. UCS 16, hey, woo! They have a nice shirt. So as I was, I was preparing, I think maybe we should kind of go back and kind of review what is this class actually covering and how this all kind of plays out in the uh, grand scheme of things. And so in fact, 16A has three pretty much modules, right? Uh, the first module, we introduce you to systems, um, how we collect data, how we build models, and we kind of have the, uh, we had the imager or imaging as a, a running example uh, in the class. And I would just kept saying tomography, tomography, tomography nonstop and already said that. In module two, you were introduced into circuits and designs. And so how do you um, use these models to solve problems? So you've designed a touch screen. You know how to do that. Uh, we, we, last lecture, we designed a timer, right? A timer based on all sorts of uh, components that we have and the models that we have for those components to build a system 
at the end. And now we're into uh, the third module. And also, by the way, I had these kind of funny jokes that you really didn't get, you know, in the, in the first lecture. Right? It, was, it wasn't really that funny, right? Like, well, I love eigenvalues. It's still probably not funny to some of you. Um, but for example, squiggly's futile. I mean, that's pretty cool, right? That's funny, right? right? And what about what part of this thing you don't understand? Now, now you understand, actually, what is this, uh, or supposed to at least understand, what is this thing over here? OK, so that's cool. So at least you learned something. And now you can, you can laugh. OK, nice. nice. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, it's great. OK, so then, um, and then now, in the third module, we're going to introduce you to signal processing and some, sort, some, some machine learning and, uh, um, and analysis. And really, the question here that we're going to cover is like, how do we um, learn models from data? So if we've got data, and we want to be able to model it, how do we learn those models and, and parameters? And how we go about in making predictions uh, based on these. Now, in 16b, which we highly recommend for you uh, to take, then you go into deeper parts of what we've covered in this class. You go advanced circuit design and analysis. Like when you think about capacitors, right, we only put like current through them, but we really didn't look at the dynamic of what's going on. And of course, there is a lot of dynamic going on, and be able to analyze that and also add another component called an inductor, and really to understand what is those transients that happen. Those are extremely important. Um, and then, of course, in module five there, you introduce to control and robotics, um, and then do, again, data analysis, signal processing, but a little more advanced. Okay, so that's, that's next. And the lab examples, again, it's, it's really just useful to go over, right? We first had an imaging lab where you build an imager and you use linear algebra in order to recover those images. That's quite fascinating. with just a single pixel, right? Like you thought of a different way of creating an image, right? Just by using projection and just a single sensor, which is really the opposite of, of how cameras work, where you've got like a single source that lights everything and then you use a lens and, a, and an array in order to make the image. But you know, this, this is, this, it's a, we wanted you to think a little bit differently in order to do that. Then uh, in lab two, you built a touch screen. And the lab three, or, you know, or the, the lab that associated with, it's not lab three, but associated with the third module, is going to be about global positioning. How do you find your place in the world? Um, and what we're going to use is acoustic uh, lo location, so it's uh, APS, acoustic uh, positioning, uh, which is very similar to the way GPS works. Uh, anybody has a GPS receiver on them right now? Raise your hand if you don't have. Yeah, everybody has a GPS receiver. Wow. I mean, think about it, it's just like this revolution is just unbelievable. And you're going to learn the concept like cross correlation and optimization in order to be able to, uh, to find out where you are from the signals that you're going to pick up. Okay. So in this module, um, we're going to talk about classification. So classification is, for example, uh, a computer sees a picture of myself or sees a picture of Anna, how, they, how a computer can determine which one is which. We're going to look at estimation, for example, how to estimate model parameters from data, and then also how to predict. So remember this I showed you uh, last time. This is a fictional data set that I've provided with you, uh, where the plant growth rate versus the amount of water that the plant receives. And let's say these are kind of observations that we made in the real world. I faked it, but yeah. But let's say these are observations that um, that exists, and then you want to create a model to, to pretty see kind of what's, what's the relationship, right? To define a relationship. So what, what kind of model then you can do that? Use a simple model, right? Like, I mean, this is just a scatter plot of points. But what, what people often do to that type of stuff if they want to understand a model or like to derive some model, whether that model really represent the truth behind it, that, that's maybe something, but you know, sometimes it could approximate. So what do you think? 
What kind of model you can think about that we can represent this data? What? Regression, regression of what? Oh, a line regression, right? A line represents by two parameters, right? The, uh, the offset or the intercept point and then the slope, right? You can go and fit a line to this and say, oh yeah, that's, that's how plant grows. Like you, the more you add water, then linear, you know, that's a linear relationship here. And it kind of, kind of pretty good. Like it fits pretty well to this data. So this is a model that we can basically use um, in order to kind of try to understand how plants behave and then report that. Oh, the slope is that. And you know, uh, if I don't give them, uh, give the plant any water, then I'll die. Right and so on and so forth, right? So there's a lot of things that we can use this and simplify that data that we're using into basically two parameters. That's cool. Can we use this data to predict? Hell yeah, right? I can predict, well, let's add more water, right? Let's add more water and then the plant's just gonna be huge, right? Like, it's like, whoa, it's gonna be insane. So the more water we had, we can predict that that's gonna happen. Now the question is, is this prediction valid with, is this a good prediction? Yeah, no, right, because we know by prior knowledge that, you know, if you water too much, then plants die as well. So instead, what we can maybe try to do is like find a better model and fit the data, for example, to let's say a quadratic function. And a quadratic function, I mean, it still kind of fits well the data, right? Um, where data is, but maybe this type of model is better in predicting what's gonna happen when we uh, go outside of that range that we did, right? And, and really, when we try to fit models and use predictions, it's all about how good your model is representing the real world. And, and often they're, they're good sometimes, and sometimes they're not that great, okay? So it really depends. And engineers, we need to understand that. Um, you know, obviously it's very hard to predict the future. Like, but in hindsight, everything is obvious, right? Like once something happened, oh yeah, that was because of blah, 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 blah. But predicting it, you know, who knows? And the example that we're gonna use, uh, uh, use uh, in this class is, is based on basically GPS. And GPS is this amazing, amazing system. I mean, Don't take it for granted. This is ridiculous technology. Developed a long time ago by the US government first, now there's a lot of other systems that are built by uh, Russia, China, and the European Union. Uh, and the idea there, if you wanna find your position in space on Earth, you're gonna launch satellites that will orbit Earth in a medium orbit, so no low Earth orbit, but medium Earth orbit. And we're gonna cover enough of Earth of these satellites. And based on the fact that we know the position of the satellites, they're gonna be transmitting those signals and then a receiver will be able to figure out, figure out where they are on the surface of the Earth. Like think about that from a conceptual point of view, like just thinking, oh they, yeah, that can be done. And that was released in the 80s, right? So it's just like also technology wasn't that advanced compared to what we have right now. It's insane. Actually, 70s or 80s, something like that. It's insane. These birds, you know, these satellites are flying in space, hundreds of miles above us, orbiting, right, at ridiculous speeds, transmitting these beacons, and you are sitting with your phone, receiving those signals from space, and are able to find your position up to about a few meters anywhere on this planet. Okay? Whew. Right? That is insane. And the fact that you have just a small chip inside your phone that can actually do that, that's, I mean, I, I had a GPS in the 90s that I got in, when I served in the army, and it was just that, that big. And it was just report numbers, like coordinates. Didn't even have a map or anything. Okay, it was okay. So how do we find? How do we find? How does GPS actually works? You know where the satellites are. 
because we, you know, they, they are in a known orbit, it's high enough, so there's no drag or not, not a lot of drag. Uh, there's actually a little bit of a drag there, so you have to predict that. Um, and then they transmit their, their signal, and I receive the signal, and their time is synchronized. All these satellites have the same time. How? They carry an atomic clock on each one of those satellites. By the way, just because of that, you have an atomic clock in your pocket. Like, the accuracy of your clock can be as good as that clock, too, which is also insane. Okay? Just because of that, we carry atomic clocks in our pockets. Okay? So they're all synchronized, and they're sending those beacons. And you're receiving those. And based on the timing that you get those beacons, based on those timings, you can figure out your distance to these satellites. Okay, so for example, that yellow satellite is kind of emitting a beacon. Okay, and I receive it, and now I know the distance. So where am I? In I'm going to just give you an example of a two-dimensional space problem. Where am I with respect to that satellite? You know? I know where the satellite is, so where can I be with respect to that satellite? If I know, I know the time, I know the speed of light, I know the distance. So that defines a circle of where I'm, you know, I could be. And so it defines this yellow circle where in this two-dimensional space that I could be, right? Is that enough? No, there's a lot of uncertainty here in terms of where I am. So I'm listening to maybe uh, the blue satellite. Okay, all right. Now I can figure out the timing for the blue satellite, and that defines another circle. And circles intersect at two points. So there's still an uncertainty of where I am. Right, so two satellites are not enough. By the way, if I know my position right now and I move a little bit, and now I only hear two satellites, well, I can then figure out maybe it's this point, right? So there is some prior knowledge that I can do, but in general, two are not enough to figure out my position. There is two points that I can actually be. If it's in three-dimensional space, then it will be a circle. It will be three spheres that are in, uh, two spheres that are intersecting. Okay, so different. So I need another one, right? So I'm listening now to the, uh, uh, what color is that one? Orange. That's orange. Kind of looks brown. Yeah, orange. Okay, fine, orange. So I'm listening to the orange satellite. Okay, and I receive, and now I've got another um, measurement, and then hopefully I can from that figure out where I am. Okay, that's how it works. So, known position, synchronized timings, and different beacons so I can separate between the signals that are being transmitted in order to figure out where I am. So, satellites, 24 satellites for GPS, but there's GNSS, now there's more because you can actually have chips that also receive signals from the European ones, from the Chinese, from, from the Russians as well. Oh, uh, I was just wondering for that previous example you were showing, um, can't you just use one satellite and then use the angle to figure out where we are? Or does the satellite not keep track of the, like, direction? <laughs> the angle. Well, uh, that's interesting. Uh, that can help if you have a directional antenna to figure out where the signal is highest. But that's not how GPS wor uh, work, right? So, yeah, that would give you maybe a little bit more information, but not, not perfectly. I know where the satellite is, by the way. I just don't know where I am. You can try to go and figure that out, but... It's difficult, okay? So this is not how the system works because that requires you to walk with directional antennas all the time, you know, like that. And then know actually where you're aiming at, and, uh, you know. Okay, so 24 satellites, um, we know the position, they're time synchronized. Usually eight are visible because they're high enough so they have good coverage, so eight would be visible. And the, really the problem that we want to talk about, and we're going to teach you stuff like, well, you know, some concept. The concept that we're going to teach you is cross-correlation. I'm going to teach you, um, we're going to talk about least squares and stuff like this. But 
really the problem is to classify which satellite is being is transmitting. Once you classify which one's transmitting, we estimate the distance to the GPS. And then if we know we know all these satellites, what are distances from us to the, uh, the satellites, then from that, from those observations, which could be noisy, we want to figure out our position. That is the problem, and that's what we're going to cover over the next few lectures. Okay? So the tools that we're going to use is inner product, cross-correlation, and we're going to use least squares. I learned least squares in grad school. I did not learn least square before that. And the fact that you're learning that as freshmen, most of you, I find it actually quite fascinating. Okay? It's an extreme, I was just wowed when I first saw this because the geometry is fascinating. It's one of the most useful algorithms there is. It's used all the time by, in almost everything. Okay, so we're going to talk about that. Oh, got to show this one. So I teach a class on amateur radio. Uh, this is a uh, freshman seminar, freshman sophomore seminar. And in this uh, freshman so sophomore seminar, we take uh, a transponder. It's about nine grams. Uh, and we, um, that transponder has a radio on it, has a GPS receiver, has a microprocessor. We power it with, um, with, uh, with, with Anna really loves. Solar cells. Solar cells and uh, has capacitors to kind of store some charge there and then it just flies and then transmits its position. And we're gonna track those balloons. That's what we do at the end of the class. It's quite fascinating. So let me just show you this. So if you look at this device, it's really small. I mean, this, by the way, this is all driven by, um, you know, basically integrated circuit revolution. The fact that you can make really complicated systems at a small size, it's just unbelievable. unbelievable. Hardware, hardware is key. Yeah, it's just at the end, at the end, I mean, in order to be able to do that, this is just dominated by, by the physics, you know, the fact that you can actually do this. Okay, so stare at this. This is a chip here. This is a monolithic chip that is an integrated circuit that does everything to do with GPS receiving. Okay, it receives radio frequency signals and spits out its position. And everything is done inside that chip. Both analog processing, digital processing, it has kind of microprocessors and amplifiers, and all that stuff built in. And all the operations that we're gonna talk about them, they're done in that tiny chip that costs 10 bucks. 10 bucks, okay? This tiny thing weighs nothing. And this is why I can put them on the, that transponder. It's ridiculous. Of course, it needs to receive something as this is a GPS antenna. I'll just kind of show you this device because I wanna encourage you maybe to take that class. It's pretty cool. This is kind of an Arduino-like processor. So it talks to that, to that chip and you know gets the information out of it and then it also talks to the radios there's resistors here oh look at them there's tiny resistors actually this the whole thing over here implements a digital to analog converter uh, that you'd be implementing similar one in 16b okay and then oh capacitors those are all sorts of filters and stuff like that over here so that's cool and then on the back there is a kind of a module that does radio. Basically, it's a whole radio that transmit at about half a watt to a watt out of it, which then you can send your position through it. Pretty cool. Uh, this is how you put it. So you have two super capacitors over here uh, and as well as a solar cell and you connect it to a balloon. And this is from the roof of Cori. We launched these two balloons and this particular one run went through from uh, Berkeley all the way across the United States and across the Atlantic, was rediscovered in Port uh, around Portugal and then lost somewhere over the Mediterranean. And last semester, we actually uh, got to Kazakhstan. Yep. Yeah, almost to the Chinese border. So cool. Almost. And we're gonna launch it in two weeks, so you're gonna get some updates. We have to hope for good weather. What? Good weather. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so here's the problem. The problem is classification. Classification is really important problem. Okay, 
is this signal that we get from this class or from this class. I mean, whoa. I mean, there's now definitely with all the AI stuff, I mean, think about it. Like, there's so many things that are going on. There's all these challenges, by the way. Um, you know, is, is this image has a cat? Is this one has a mouse? Or is this one has a professor? And so on and so forth, right? OK. So the problem with classification, the, again, satellites transmit some unique code. Like, for example, uh, a code could sound like Okay, something like that. And another code could sound like, yeah. And then you're sitting over here uh, with your phone, probably checking, what's the most popular, Instagram? Messages, games. Uh, Pokemon, nah, Pokemon Go is so like 2017. Yeah. Anyway, some of you are also Pokemon Go. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing you. Sometimes I go into that too. OK. Um, and so what we're going to do now is to try to kind of model this in this interesting way so that we can maybe solve that problem. OK. So you're kind of staring at your phone. And then the satellite is transmitting. The satellite is transmitting. Well, somebody's on their phone. OK. And that, that signal, what we're going to now, I mean, it's analog signal, right? It's constant, like it's continuous time. But we're going to represent it using discrete numbers. And let's say it's just transmitting the signal, which is 1 and 1. Okay? We're just going to model this as a discrete something. But if you think about it, what is 1, 1? It's just like something that is just continuously on for a certain amount of time. Okay? And that's, that's what it's sending. And then the other satellite is transmitting, yeah, so 1 and minus 1, for example. And then we're receiving the signal, right? Like this is radio frequency at about 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, there's a good reason why to pick up those frequencies. The wavelength is small enough so you can have like small antennas. Um, still penetrates through windows and stuff like that. Um, so there's kind of like a trade-off there. Okay, and then we're receiving something, and this is what we're receiving. Okay, so we're receiving the signal over time, and I'm gonna just sample it, and I'm you know, and I'm sampling at this point, and what I've received is 0 0.93 and minus 1.1. And the question is, the real question is, which satellite was received? among the two. Which satellite? Well, they have colors. Which satellite? Blue or blue. orange? Yeah. The blue. Well, how do you know that it's the blue? <laughs> how do you know it's the blue? It's the color of the, of the curve? It's this color? Is this how you know? No. What are you doing is you're doing what humans are very good at. Pattern matching. Our visual system is amazing at pattern matching. How many times you looked at something and like, oh, what a nice face in this cloud, right? Or like you're imagining things that really are not there, but it's like, oh, wow, that's so cool. Uh, there's actually a whole list of you know, places where you can find Jesus. But, you know, like in, in x-ray and MRI, you know, inside people, because there is something that kind of pattern matches to a very common picture of Jesus. Okay, so people pattern match all the time. And that's basically what you did. You compared. You compared what we sent, and you compared this, and you say, oh, that's, that's the pattern. Your brain did something. What did your brain do? Because we need to, we want a computer to do that. We don't want your brain. We don't want to have a lot of people pattern matching all the time. That's not fast. We want a computer to be able to do that. Okay? And we want to also say how well that match is. Quantify it. So what do we do? We need to come up with a method that can compare things and say, oh, this one is closer to this one. 
in some sense. What if this was a little bit more noisy? I mean, maybe you're going to be mixed. And what if I have more cells? Maybe the code is going to be more complicated. It will be hard for you to kind of match. So we need to define, you come up with something that will be able to do that. So, ready? Yes. Oh. Fine, Waldo, I found you. Yeah, let's do it. I want to talk about inner product. Anybody knows what inner product is? We kind of mentioned that, right? Like I remember when I did like, like this, like that, and I says, you know, when it's like, you know, certain situations, sometimes it's called an inner product, some of it's called an outer product. I said we're going to talk about that. Don't worry about it now. Well, now's the moment to worry, to worry about it. We're going to basically now understand what an inner product is, but I'm going to generalize it and explain an inner product in a generalized sense, and then we're going to go to the inner product that we talked about. An inner product really provides you some measure of similarity between vectors in a vector space. Like how close they are. It's some measure of distance. Okay? So that's, that could be useful if you want to do classification. Is this close? Is this similar? Is this similar? Right? That's, that's one way that you could do it. Okay? So here's the definition. For a real valued vector space, real valued, not complex valued. Complex value will be slightly different. Okay, there's gonna be nuances with complex. So just if you want to talk about complex, 16b, you're gonna do inner products in complex. 16a for real. Okay, we'll keep a keep a real, keep a real. So we've got two vectors, u and v, that are in a vector space. Now, that's the nice thing is that we define what a vector space is. So we already know what U of V properties are. OK, that's cool, right? We just know what they are because we just said, oh, it's a vector space. And then I'm going to find this. Ooh, this is a bracket. I put U comma V inside brackets. And I said, you know what? If I have this operation, two brackets, comma in between two vectors, they result in a single real number, scalar. That operation of inner product, vector comes in, vector comes in, scalar comes out. Vector comes in, vector comes in, scalar comes out. Pretty cool. So it spits out a real number. Now, that operation is called an inner product if it satisfies certain criteria. Not everything is an inner product. Because I can come up with a lots of operations that if I take two vector two vectors and compute something on them, that will result in a scalar. Not all of them are inner products, only those that satisfy the following conditions. And now we're going to do another blah, blah, blah definitions. Those definitions are useful because, again, once you have those definitions, you can leverage a lot of things that inner products then satisfy. Okay. First one, symmetry. Symmetry means that if I have an inner product between u and v, it will be the same if I have an inner product between v and u. So if I flip the sides, If I flip the size, then, uh, then you know, get the same thing. By the way, not true, not true for complex. Okay, that's kind of one of the issues there. For complex value, you have to do some conjugation. But don't worry about it, 16b. Ooh, there's another one, linearity. Okay, if I scale one of those vectors before computing the inner product, so I scale it to u, before computing the inner product, it will be the same as first computing the inner product and then scaling after. Okay? That is homogeneity. Also, superposition or um, distributivity, I guess. If I take two vectors and I add them together and compute 
an inner product with another vector, it is the same as taking the first vector and computing an inner product, and then taking the second vector and computing an inner product, and then add the results later. Okay, that's linearity. We've seen that. So inner product needs to satisfy linearity. And then something that we never talked about. And that property is called positive definiteness. That means that if I take a vector and I take an inner product with itself, it will always be greater or equal to zero. Okay? And then if that inner product equals zero, then that vector has to be zero. It cannot be anything else. Okay? So inner product of a vector with itself will always be positive or zero. And if it is zero, then the vector guarantees to be zero. Okay, that's a property. It's a property. And that would help us with this definition of, you know, that of the whole thing about similarity. Okay? Because if you think about similarity between a vec myself and myself, I'm pretty similar to myself, right? So if I'm not similar to myself, then I'm probably nothing. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. It could apply, uh, the alpha could apply Can one of Can you repeat them. the like, question? So why is the alpha multiply the first one and not the second? Yeah, well, I mean, I also said symmetry, so that should be also the same way, right? So if I multiply alpha by V times alpha, it should also be satisfying the same thing. Okay? And if I multiply both of them, that it will not be true because it will be alpha squared. Oh, so let's go through examples. By the way, uh, we had this uh, midterm, uh, uh, mid-semester survey. And one of the comments that I got was that the examples that we show in lecture are quite simplified. And we should do more complicated examples similar to the one in discussion. I hear you. Let me just give you the rationale behind that. The rationale is to introduce you to simple stuff first in lecture, that you then go and go through more complicated example in the discussion. If we would have also add, you know, complicated example in the lecture, that kind of defeat that purpose, and we won't be able to cover material. So that's why the that's why we have a discussion. So I'm still gonna keep more simplified. Though I hear you, but the idea is to you, you practice this in discussion and homework. But the basics we'll give you in, in lecture. Okay, that's so I'm gonna give a very simple example. And this one is it called an Euclidean linear product. The thing is there's different type of inner products, because now we have all these properties. So maybe different inner products will satisfy that. And so I'm just gonna define one that's called the Euclidean one. And the definition of the Euclidean one is if I take two vectors, x and y, that belong to Rn, then that thing here, the inner product, is the finite. Now I'm going to define the mathematical operations of how to actually compute it. It's going to be x transpose y. Does it spit one number? Does it spit? Well, let's do it. It is like that, right? It does. x transpose y will spit one number. Okay, so that, that's great. Okay, so like this, like that. Y transpose X, X transpose Y doesn't, um, doesn't actually matter in that case. Um, and you get just a single number at the end. Okay, well, that, that's good. That's a good start. But let's now show that this is actually, in fact, an error product. So we want to test that this is true. How do we test? Well, we have these three tests to go through. The first one is symmetry. Is x transpose y and y transpose x the same? Are they the same? Like this, like that? If 
I flip it like this, like that, do I get the same values? Y1 multiplies X1. Y2 multiplies X2, no matter what. Right? No matter what, Y1 multiplies X1. Y2 multiplies X2. Y3 multiplies X3. Right? And then if you flip it, X1 multiplies Y1. Right? So it, it just works. Okay, so we can be happy about that. Is vector multiplication linear? We already showed that too. So if we have a times x, comma y, inner product between that, then this is really the calculation of it, right? So it doesn't matter if I multiply alpha, alpha or a, is that a or alpha? A, by x and then compute the inner product, or I first compute the inner product and then multiply by, by A. Does it matter? It doesn't, right? It doesn't matter if I do it before or I do it afterwards, because that's the properties of vectors. And what about distributivity? If I first add these two and then compute the inner product, then this is X plus Z transpose times Y. Do I need to first, is it going to be different if I first add these and do transpose times y, or I do x transpose y and z transpose y and then add it? Think about it. Well, I can definitely open those brackets, right? Because that's legal. So I can write x transpose y plus z transpose y. Well, then that basically means I can first compute this and this. I don't need to add them first, right? So yes. Check. Positive definiteness. Let's go about that. Shall we? Do it Positive. in your head. Positive. Do it in your head. X transpose times X. Is that positive definite? X and X is X transpose X. What does X transpose X mean? Like this, like that, X1 times X1. That's X1 squared. Plus X2 times X2. That's X2 squared. X3 times X3. That's x3 squared. Can squaring a number result in a negative? Not for real, but for complex, maybe. That's why there's going to be some conjugation in complex, right? Because otherwise it doesn't work. But we're not going to. We just stay for real here. So this is always positive definite. And the only way to get the result being zero is that all x1, x2, x3, x4 are equal to zero. That's the only way. Ah. Cool. Got yourself a Euclidean inner product. Okay? But it doesn't have to end there. We can make another inner product. And I just want to show you like another one. Okay? Here's another one. It's called a weighted inner product. And there, we're going to define three things, x, y, and q. q is the real matrix that's n by n. It is symmetric with positive eigenvalues. Symmetric matrix with positive eigenvalues. Okay. I'm not going to show you now, and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm going to define the inner product as x comma y being x transpose q times y. Just to find it. Why not? Now the question is, does it satisfy the properties of inner product? Okay, that's, that's the real question. Does it satisfy? Obviously, because I said weighted and stuff like this, I mean, you know, it's like, yeah, probably, but let, let's show that is actually the case. And I'm, again, not going to go through the full, a complicated example of every 
possible positive definite matrix, uh, uh, matrix with positive eigenvalues that is symmetric, I'm just going to use a specific matrix. How do I, if I have a diagonal matrix, what's, what's the eigenvalues of a diagonal matrix? The diagonals, the diagonals. So now it's easy to find one, right? Let's start with just diagonal matrix and just put positive values on the diagonal, then it satisfies what I just said, okay? So that is positive eigenvalues. Is it symmetric? Because on both sides of the diagonal, there's zeros, so it should be symmetric, okay? So here's the matrix. Let's pick this one, Q equals one, zero, zero, three. This is diagonal, positive, and the zeros on both sides, so it's symmetric. Great. And we're just gonna give this example in R2, not even R3, just R2. And so we need to check for symmetry. Is Q transpose Q times Y the same as Y transpose Q times X? So we do the calculation, x1, x2, times this, like this, like that, like that, like that, like that, like that, like that. I guess like that. And then, um, let's see, x1 multiplied by one, x2 multiplied by zero, so you get x1. And then x2 multiplied by, z sorry, this times that, blah, blah, blah. We get basically this result, x1 and three x2, after multiplying these two. After multiplying these two, I get that, okay? It just scales the second, the second component is being scaled. Okay, stare at this a lot, and do you agree that this? Raise your hand if you agree. Okay, and now I need to multiply these two, like this, like that, like this, like that, and I get x1, y1 plus three x2, y2. Now I'm going to do the opposite, y transpose q times x. I write it here. I'm going to multiply this by that. I'm going to get y1, 3y2 times that. Right, it's just translate, everything is flipped. And then when I multiply these two, I will get x1, y1 plus 3, x2, y2. Oh, does that work? It doesn't matter. Uh, why do I first do y transpose times q and not, let's say, q times x first? Yeah. I can do whatever, because it's like it doesn't matter, right? Like it's properties of, of a matrix vector multiplication is that I can actually multiply the, you know, it doesn't matter which one I multiply first. Otherwise, it's going to be a problem. So these are the same. It's a symmetry check. Love it. What about linearity? Let me argue it's pretty obvious because it's exactly what we did before. It's matrix vec matrices and vectors multiplication. We showed that are linear. I'm gonna skip that and just smile and wave. Wave and smile, right? You agree? What about positive definiteness? Ooh, that, that could be interesting. And here's actually where it's important that the eigenvalues are positive. Because if the eigenvalues are not positive, then that's, that could be a problem. But if the eigenvalues are positive, then I have, if I have Q transpose Q times X, then I would have Q, you know, this times that, and like this, like that, like that, I will get X1 square plus three X two square. Is that always greater than or equal to zero? Yes, they're all squared. And what about equal to zero? Yeah, only when the two are zero. Why would you use though, yes, yeah, so this is the inner product. Why would you use this inner product as opposed to another, like the, the, the one before that, where it wasn't weighted? Uh, there could be something important with X2 that you want to have more of that affecting your result. Ah, in the similarity, Maybe there's one value which is more important, or maybe there's 
one value that's uh, maybe is corrupted more, suffers from more interference or noise, and I want to adjust for that. Then I would use a weighted, uh, a weighted uh, you know, product as opposed to non-weighted, right? For example, um, I don't want to give an example, right? It's just like, I can't think of it. No, I, I can't follow. But like, uh, oh yeah. Let's say, um, think out of the box. I'll think out of the box. Let's say I want to identify students based on their grade. Okay, and the grades for midterm two were all the same. And grades for midterm one are different. So, and, or not completely the same, but like they're kind of, uh, grades for midterm two are kind of very narrow range, right? So they don't change much. But for midterm one, they're a lot different. And so if I want to compute then an error product, well, I want to wait midterm one more then I want to wait midterm two because midterm two doesn't provide me enough information. Does that make sense? That's an example. Or what if uh, using one measurement, you know, I got like this really cool measurement, the other one kind of my hand was like shaking and I couldn't, right? So oh, it might still be useful, but I want to wait it less, the other measurement. Great. All right, I want to talk about norms. Norms are important. Every inner product has an associated norm with that inner product, and that norm really is a measure of length of those elements in the vector space. Now, there are norms that are not associated with inner products, but every inner product will have an associated norm. Okay? You can invent a norm that there is no inner product associated with it, but if you invent an inner product, it will have a norm associated with it. Does that make sense? It's like a one-way thing. And basically, a norm is these two lines next to a vector. And then, oh, I didn't tell them about the bras and the cats and stuff. Should I? Should I? Yeah. I think they deserve the same jokes as previous semesters. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. And they ask questions, I forgot. they participate. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so you know this, x transpose y, right? It's like this is a this is this is a bracket. Right? This is brackets and with a comma in between, right? And this is x transpose y. So guess what? In chemistry or in like quantum mechanics, they will define a row vector. They call it a bra. And they will mark it sorry, and they would mark it as X. And I say X is a bra. Mm -hmm. And then a column vector, they like to call them cats in quantum mechanic. And if you have Something that looks like this, you know it's a column vector, and they call it a ket. Mm -hmm. And when they want to compute an inner product, they do a bracket. But it's the same terminology, right? It's just slightly different, awkward, but in a cool way, though. So that's the bra and kets. Okay? So if you take quantum mechanics class, you'll learn about brackets, brackets and bra and kets, and you know that these are just row vectors and column vectors. Instead of applying transpose, you would just call it a bra. Mm -hmm. Physicist sense of humor. Uh, it's, yeah, physicists and chemists and all this. Good stuff. Norms. Okay, norms are two lines next to a vector, okay? And it's defining the square root of the inner product with a vector with itself. Okay? So the cool thing about it, if this is an inner product, then this is always positive, then I can take a square root and it's fine. It'll still be real. Right? And that's the definition of a norm. A norm also have properties, like everything. It 
homogeneity applies. That means that if I scale a vector first, it's the same as, uh, and then computing the norm, is the same as computing the norm of a vector and multiplying with the absolute value of that scalar. Okay, that's homogeneity. Non-negativity. Norms always positive. They measure length. What is the negative length? It's just long in the other way. I mean, like, it's, you know, like it's, what is, there's no such thing in terms of length. Length is a measure that's positive, so it's non-negative. And so always the norm is greater or equal to zero. And because this is an inner product, that is true. That applies because of that. And then it should satisfy the triangle inequality. And the triangle inequality says the following. If you take two vectors and add them together and then compute the norm, that is always less or equal to, less or equal to, than computing the norm of one and adding it to the norm of the other. It could be equal, but it's always less or equal. It can never be bigger. Triangle inequality, and it comes from triangles, the vertices of triangles. Okay? If that's satisfied, then it's a norm. And so here you go. If we have an Euclidean, in our product, it has an associated Euclidean norm. And this is actually the norm that we're really familiar with, right? It's really represent length in a Euclidean space, like in just our R2 and R3 space. Yeah, it's great. So the way to compute it, so I've got this X, which is in Rn, that's a vector space. I define an inner product, X and X to be X transpose X. And so the norm of x is the square root of x transpose x. That's the length of the vector x. That's the way to compute it, the length of the vector x. And so specific example in R2, if I have this vector, what's the first component, x1? What is x1? Well, x1 is this thing like here at the bottom, and x2 is this one, right? This is a right angle triangle. Do you know Pythagorean theorem? x1 square plus y1 square equal to this square, right? Guess what? X transpose X is X1 square plus X2 square. And then the length of this thing is the square root. Pretty cool. That's a distance. This is one distance called an L2 distance. It's called Euclidean distance. And that's the distance if I try to measure. Uh, what's your name at the, at the corner there? Yep. What's your name? Solomon. Solomon? So mil, is that right? Okay, let's say I want to measure my distance. I shine a laser in your eye, but it has to be type A, you know, like uh, just, uh, just uh, um, class A or, you know, class one or two, but not class three, because that will be damaging your eye. And I measure the distance between us, and that will be the Euclidean distance, okay? There's another norm. When it's called the L1 norm or the Manhattan norm, which is the sum of the absolute value, is no associated um, inner product with it, but it is still a norm. And that measure, it's called the Manhattan norm because in order to get to that corner, I have to go straight. Right? I don't want to jump over all of you and all these skyscrapers. And then I'm going to get to here. Right? But that's the sum of the absolute value of the coordinates, and that's the L1 norm, or Manhattan norm, or sum of absolute value. Okay? Cool. Very useful, by the way, uh, L1 norm for all sorts of things. But right now we're using just L2. Okay, so now I want to talk about the geometrical interpretation of an inner product and why actually it is a measure of similarity, because we, I didn't really explain that. So let's, let's talk about that. I want to measure the inner product between y and x. 
Okay? And I want to show you that it is a measure of similarity. And how do we then go about it? I want to write x in an interesting way, though, that depends on angles. x, can I write x as the norm of x, that's its length, times the cosine of theta, which is the angle of that, and then sine of theta? Can I write that? Because in fact, if this is the length, then this would be the cosine of theta, and this axis will be the sine of theta times x. And so that should be OK, right? I can write it that way in just different coordinates. One that gives me the length, and this is the angle, as opposed to writing x1 and x2. Does that make sense? But x1 is the length times cosine theta. x2 is the length times sine theta. Can I write that that way? You remember trigon trigonometry? It's like, it's like, but if you don't, then just believe me that this, this is true, because when I take cosine theta times uh, the length of x, then I get the length of this one. Okay? Yeah, these are also co uh, considered polar coordinates. That's right. Yeah, polar coordinates. Okay, well, that's great. Why I can write in the same way, but now instead of theta, I'm going to use phi. Phi or phi? One of phi. Oof. Okay. Wait. Now let's compute the Euclidean inner product between those two representations. That's going to get messy, okay? So just walk with me. For an Euclidean inner product, and again, I'm just like, just ignore this for a second. For Euclidean inner product, x transpose times y, I would get the norm of x, the norm of y, and then like this, like that, right? So cosine theta times cosine phi, phi, plus sine theta times sine phi, uh, phi, okay? Like this, like that, like this, like that. So the cosine will match the cosine, the sine will match the sine, then you add together. Okay? X transpose Y, Y, you know, that's it. That's the result. Ooh, that's kind of messy. But uh, if you go back to your high school age and, you know, you learn geometry, and do you know what the formula for that one? It's what? Theta plus phi. Uh, same, same, but different. No, it's actually theta minus, uh, it's phi minus theta. Okay, so if you look at this, it's actually phi minus theta. And what is phi minus theta? Phi minus theta is this alpha. Okay, I mean, like, this trigonometry. Like, you can just go in the book and just look at them and just, like, go, like, oh, wow, this was so hard of a class. I mean, but you learned this, like, four years ago. Right? So ninth grade, my, my kids are learning that. Okay, so cosine, cosine alpha. So now I've got x, norm of x, norm, t norm of y, times cosine alpha. That's actually another way of writing an inner product. It depends on the angle between those vectors. It depends on the length. It depends on the inner product between those. And now you can kind of start seeing why this is a good measure of similarity. Okay? Because, because, um, if the angle, it's a cosine of an angle, right? It's a cosine of an angle. So cosine of an angle is high when the angle is close to zero. So that means that those vectors are aligned. Cosine of an angle is, goes to zero as they're more separated, right? And then when you start going the other way, then you start being aligned again. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, but in the negative direction. So that's, that's a good measure of similarity, right? Okay, so what is orthogonality for an inner product that is defined this way with two vector x and y? They're said to be orthogonal if the inner product equals zero. That means that x, inner product with y, 
is the norm of x, norm times norm of y, cosine theta. And if so, theta, what needs to be, sorry, alpha, what alpha needs to be for that to be equal to 0? Wait, radians or degrees? What do you want? Radians. Pi over 2. If it's pi over 2, then that will be 0. Cosine of pi over 2, or 90 degrees, it will be 0. Right? So anything that looks like that is orthogonal. Whoa, hold on, but we know that. We know that these are orthogonal, right? But like, that's kind of definition that comes from, from inner product. So anything that's orthogonal will result in 0. <sighs> no, nothing. It's good. It's a good measure. So alpha has to be pi over 2. So then you've got this beautiful Cauchy-Schwartz inequality that basically is representing kind of what an inner product could be, what is the maximum of an inner product could be. So if you consider x and y, then I would argue that, yeah, this, the inner product of that, the norm of that, the norm of these two, is this, and then absolute value over it. it needs to be here. Absolute value over it. Oh, no, actually, I did, I did fine. Then, basically, what the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality says, that the inner product between x and y is always, always less than the norm of x times the norm of y. And the reason is, if we compute the inner product between x and y, when is it going to be maximum? It's going to be maximum when these are aligned where cosine theta is 1, right? That's going to be this point when they're aligned. What happens if I move an angle? Well, then, you know, it's less. It's less than the norm of x times the norm of y. And if I move further and I get to pi over 2, then I get 0. And then if I move further, then the norm of that will just grow and grow and grow till I get again to the other side when the norm is going to be high. So I'm never going to be higher in an inner product than the norm of x times the norm of y. And that's Cauchy-Schwartz inequality proven by simple graphics. Okay, this is the inequality. Oh, but we were talking about classification. How is that even useful? Guess what? Well, we said satellite transmit different codes, and we want to know which one is received. How do we know? How do we know which one is received? So this, one, this is what we received. This was sent, or this was sent. We don't know. Let's look graphically, graphically, and try to figure out which one was sent. Can we draw these? You said, yeah, I agree. We can draw a, a, a S1. S1 is like this, right? That's S1. This is 1. This is 1. And what about S2? I can draw S2. That's S2. And can I draw R, the receive signal? Yeah, absolutely, I can. It's over here. Which one's closer? How do you know? You can compute the error, right? Like the length of the error. Right? We, can, we can compute R minus S2, and then look at the length. And we compute R minus S1, and look at the length, and then compare them. And we'll get to the conclusion that R is closest to S2. Okay? But I want to get to an inner product somehow. So let's look at the length of the error vector, right? Like that length that I just showed you, let's just compute it. Okay? R minus SI, either S1, S1 or S2. Okay? And I want to look at the norm of that error. I can call this EI. Okay, error vector, EI. And I want to look at the length. 
Which one is the shortest? Well, I want to find the optimal i, either i equal 1, or i, and I'm going to use mathy here, mathy stuff here. So this is how it's written. This is how optimization is being written. Okay, I'm just going to come over here. I want to find i star, which is either 1 or 2. So I want to figure out, is it 1 or is it 2? That minimizes this norm. So which of the i's give me the smallest argument r minus si? Is it 1 or is it 2? Yeah, you're saying 2, but what, this is kind of how you write it in mathy way. Now, the cool thing about writing it this way, people reading papers will know what you're talking about. And you don't have to write in words. You just write this. i star equals argmin r minus si. That's it. Done. And actually, I think you also need to write underneath it, what is the argmin? Like, what is the minimum argument? Well, you can choose either i being 1 or 2. Okay, i could be in the set of i or 1 or 2. Okay? All right, that's just how it's written in a mathy way. Okay, so now I want to do a classification problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to square it. Uh, let's see. Is there like an Anna here? Is there an Anna here? No, that's fine. No, she's gone. Okay. Uh, so I need a volunteer. I can come. Oh, oh there, there you go. <laughs> okay, who's taller? It's pretty obvious, right? I'm taller, right? Okay, what if I square my height and I square her height? Who's gonna be, who's gonna be taller? Hmm? Same, right? What if, you know, so it doesn't matter if I square it, right? So the, cell, the argument of between one or two would be like who's, who's taller, right? Or still, don't matter if it's squared or not. So squaring preserves the differences. But that was an obvious question. Yeah, but that's what I use because I'm gonna square this. You're so funny. So I'm squaring this distance. Does it matter then which one, one or two? Is it the same problem? It is the same, this, well, it's not the same problem. It's the same solution. Same solution for a different problem, okay? Why did I do that? Because it's easier. Because when I do R minus SI norm square, now I can write it in terms of an inner product and get rid of the square, uh, get rid of the square root, because I hate square roots, okay? So I can do that. Okay, this is r minus si, comma r minus si, and I don't need to write the square root because this is squared. Okay, so what is that? Well, I'm going to open this. How do I open it? Well, I'm going to take r in our product with r minus si, it's this, minus si in a product with r minus si. Okay, I just expanded using linearity. Oh, but I have also two arguments here. So how about I do r times r minus r times, uh, you know, r minus si, and then minus, you know, and again, expand that too. And I'm going to do that. And this is my expansion. I got rr minus rsi minus sir plus sisi. Oh, wait, now I can collect things. What is r times r, r in a product with r? It's the norm square of R, right? By definition, the norm square of R. What is that? It's the norm square of SI. And these two are actually the same because of symmetry. So I'm going to write it as norm square I, norm square SI, minus twice R times SI, R uh, inner product with SI, okay? Oh, wait. Here's what I want to show you. And I'm just going to finish and steal one minute. This property, R, does it, depends on I. So it's fixed, right? This one is fixed, doesn't matter. My optimization, this value, I don't care what it is. For my optimization, I need to choose one or two. 